free, right? Opposite of, of what these cats are doing. And the other cool thing he says in 26, he says, peace to you. And to me, the, and the angels actually said the same thing, because you know they're going to be freaked out. Here you are in this meeting, doors are locked, you know, for fear of the Jews, you're all huddling and praying together, next thing you know, here's Jesus. Now picture this, someone who has died, one of your good friends, next thing you know, just, you know, you're, you're having this prayer meeting, and they show up. I mean, that's the reality of what's going on here. He says, peace, relax, guys. It's all good. It'll be okay. And then he says, Tom, reach your finger in here. Put it in my side. Jesus didn't say, you're doubting. I'm not going to show up. I'm not going to present myself to you. I believe that Jesus knew his heart. I believe that Jesus knew he was, he was honestly seeking, uh, wanting to know who he was for real. And that's what he ended up doing. There's a passage, and I, and I kind of describe it this way here in my notes, that there's a difference between a searching heart and a stubborn heart. The searching heart is seriously desiring to understand more. Some of you are in here, and you're wanting to know more. I just want to know who God is. I want to know if there's any truth to this. And you're honestly seeking. I love that. God says if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. That's a promise from his word. In Acts 10, we won't get there, but you can read it yourself. There's a dude named Cornelius who, he, he had this fear of God. He had this heart to know who God was, but he didn't quite know who Jesus was. He didn't understand fully who God was. God went out of his way and actually went through an angel in a dream to this dude named Peter and said, Pete, I want you to go to this town and I want you to share Christ with this dude Cornelius. You know what, why that was going on? Because Cornelius had an honest heart. He wanted to know. And that's some of you in here, man. God will go out of his way to bring other believers around you and point you to where you can find truth finally. And you can give your life to something. To someone. But there's also the stubborn. The stubborn person. That God's knocking on their heart. And there's this, there's, well, you know, I'm not going to come to Jesus because I need, I need to see him. I need to stick my finger in his side. Jesus shows up in your life time and time again, and he says, okay, here you go. And you still continue to stiff arm God. That's the stubborn heart. I see this picture in my head of being a teenager at a party where there's alcohol and the cops come knocking on the door. And you got something going on inside. Well, everybody, hide, turn off the lights. Put all the alcohol away. That's the picture that I see presented in this. It's this stubborn, I'm cool with my sin, I don't want, whatever you show me, I'm not going there. Where are you at? Where am I at? Verse 28. So Tom answers and says to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus shows up in a powerful way in his life, and he repents, it's, that's his point of conversion. My Lord and my God. It's not my genie in a bottle and my sugar daddy. You know, it's not my Sunday savior and my cool buddy. He says, my Lord and my God. Some of you in here have said, yeah, I'm cool with God, but he is not your Lord. The Lord of your life. That's master. That's ruler. That word actually in the Greek is kurios, for you note-takers, you smart people. And, and I looked it up, it says the, and the, what the Lord means, the owner, one who has control, complete control of that person. Can you ask yourself that question? Does God have complete control of my life? Does he own me? Does he run my life? Is he the Lord? Or am I running my show still? Picture it this way. I got this illustration recently reading a book, and, and uh, it just it so convicted me. And uh, I'm going to share it with you. You can ask yourself. I, I think most of us fall in this category. And the illustration was this. Picture yourself. You're a uh, extra in a Hollywood film. And you, you got paid $100, and you're in a big party scene or whatever in the movie. 
and they just show the back of your head for three fifths of a second. And you and you start calling all your home, like the movie's about to come out, and you're texting them, yo, come, let's go check it out together. We're gonna go see this film, man. I'm in it. I mean, I made it to Hollywood. And all your homies show up and you go to the movie and like half an hour goes by and they're like, look at me like, dude, I haven't seen you up in the movie. Another half hour goes by. You're like, it's coming up. Hold on, it's, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Hour into the movie, there's the party scene, and there's the back of your head. You're like, there I am! Can't you see me? And they're like, dude, you trying to say that this movie was all about you? You were up in it for three-fifths of a second. I didn't see your ugly grill up in there, man. <laughs> Boy, I got convicted on that. Because here I think this world, this life, is all about me. I'm the star of the show. How's my life going? How are you treating me? Listen, this life is about glorifying God. The 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 a actor in this whole Hollywood film called life. We are solely his servants to point people to him. Listen, this life is no longer about you if you're a true believer in here today. If he's truly your Lord and Master. And then I love it. And then he says, my God. Again, this book was written to point people to the fact that Jesus was God in the flesh. And he comes to that realization. My Lord, my God. Notice Jesus didn't say, stop worshiping me. You'll see other times, the angels, there'll be people worshiping angels, and angels will be like, hold up, man, don't worship me like God. And other people, like, like Paul, man, Paul would, Paul would go on his missionary journeys, like miracles would happen, and people would start just bowing down to him. He'd be like, hold up, man, don't start worshiping me. Jesus didn't do that. He called him my God, and he accepted that. He is the Messiah, contrary to a lot of what people want to say. He's a good man, he's a good prophet. Mm -mm. He is God. In the flesh. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Tom, because you've seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Boy, that's all of us, isn't it? We weren't in that room, we didn't see him tangibly. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. If you look at the book of Hebrews, and you want to turn there, I'll share that with you. You can write a note down and check it out later. But Hebrews 11 is really cool because right at the first verse, it gives a great definition of what faith is. And it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And though you and I might not see Jesus tangibly, he sent his spirit to live in us. And his power rules in our life, and we can see the effects of that. It's like the wind. And I've talked about this several times. You and I can't see the wind. We can sure see the effects of the wind. Hebrews 11 goes on to say in verse 6, it says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I see Thomas diligently seeking him here. And Jesus said, man, I know you need the tangible evidence, and that's all cool, but it, the whole section of people right here, they're going to be even more blessed as they step out in faith. It's kind of like my kids when they were little. I used to chuck them up in the air all the time. Sometimes I still do that. It's a little bit harder. They're getting big, but I remember throwing them up in the air, and when I'd first throw them up, I'd see their eyes, they'd be like, ah! you know, they'd be freaking out, you know, the first couple times. And, and sometimes, man, they'd be, especially, I'm, I won't, ah, see, that's bad. But one of my boys in particular had the blood, like, curling cry, man. Is that what you call it? I don't even know what that word is, but, you know, those cries where they, ah! you know, they're just hung, you know, was hungry, and he wanted you to know about it. And I'd just take him and be like, all right, enough of that. And I'd, and I'd shot him up in the air, you know. And, but what, what happens, though, after the third or fourth or tenth toss, I don't know, whatever it is, that, that frown and that fright goes to true exhilaration, doesn't it? That, eh, it's like, 
Yeah, do it again. You know, and next thing you know, your arms are getting tired because you're tossing.